Welcome to the See Me After Class podcast. I'm your host, John Graham, and you're listening to episode four. <sighs> I saw this video that pissed me off today. It was a short comedy video revolving around this um, coffee shop barista. And the joke of the video was that one after another, all these annoying, stereotypical customers would come in, each with a kind of annoying trait that's frequently seen, I guess, among baristas. And, you know, one guy would come in and he would order some absurd fucking drink that wasn't even on the menu, and, you know, other shit like that. But this one customer came in, and, like, he's carrying a keyboard and, like, a 4x3 VGA monitor... He's kind of this buff dude with, like, long hair, and he's wearing a wife beater. Like a surfer bro kind of dude who obviously likes to use computers in cafes without a tower, by the way. Why don't you just bring in a fucking laptop? No, you're just going to bring the monitor and the keyboard? What are you going to plug the monitor into, your ass? And he says to the barista, Yeah, can I get a coffee and a free pass to sit here all day? And, you know, it's a comedy video. It's a funny joke. But part of me's thinking, you know, I do that. I, I come into cafes with a laptop and I sit down for hours getting work done. A coffee and a free pass to sit down. If I'm paying you money for the coffee, which is usually overpriced, it's not exactly a free pass, is it? It's an included pass to sit down because you have fucking tables and chairs in there. Presumably that's what they're for, sitting down. And I'm not saying I'll take up a table alone if it's like a busy cafe and people are constantly, you know, going in and coming out. Because at the end of the day, these places are businesses. And, you know, if new customers are constantly coming in, you know, they should be able to sit down. I can't be there sitting there for like five hours straight. If I see that it's a busy place, I won't stay long. Eventually, I'll pack up and leave. But most of the places I go to, there's always a few free tables. It's never that busy. And if it is, I leave like I mentioned before. You know, that's kind of the way of the world now. Sorry, guys. A lot of people get their work done on their laptops and their tablets and stuff. Technology's increasingly becoming part of our lives. I mean, it's not necessarily something I'm entirely on board with, but it's happening whether I like it or not, whether anybody likes it or not. So yeah, when I go somewhere and I buy a coffee and sit down, I want to get some work done. Maybe working from home isn't fucking ideal for everybody. Maybe people have problems at home. Maybe it's impossible to work at home for whatever reason, and they need to go somewhere to sit down and work. I'm not bothering any customers. I'm not taking all my fucking clothes off, running around the cafe, screaming at all the customers, jumping up on their tables, and me shaking my dick in their face. Yeah, I can see why you might want me to leave after that. I have a computer by myself. I'm not even making... I'm not even audible at all. I'm not talking to anybody. I'm wearing my headphones. You can't hear my computer stuff. I'm not a fucking but Who cares if I'm sitting down, especially if there's always free tables? Some of these fucking baristas with a coffee fetish. Smelly hippies with their beards and their skinny jeans. Technology is a plague on society. Everything we use should come from the earth. Let's go hug a tree together. This is a serious coffee establishment. You can't bring your laptop in here. What are you thinking? Don't believe we're serious about coffee? Check out my latte art. Sorry, I don't give a fuck about latte art, okay? It's made with love. Just give me the fucking coffee, alright? I don't need a picture of some cute little cat. I just want to drink the fucking thing. Look, I know I sound like an angry fucking psycho, okay? But it's for the podcast. This is where I get all my energy out. I'm not like this day to day. I know how to reel it in. I actually like this podcasting thing a lot more than I thought, because it's like therapeutic for me to like once a week just get all this negative energy out and you know it's entertaining to listen to right it's a comedy podcast all right at the end of the day i'm just trying to make you guys laugh and make you entertained for an hour because this stuff's funny right would you rather i talk about how great everything's going for me for an hour and you know i get it i might be overly calloused about school i'm sure there's a lot of listeners that really enjoy their time at school and, you know, they're grateful to have an education. Then, you know, they listen to me and they're like, Jesus, this guy, why, why does he have such a problem? Why is he so bitter? And look, I kind of hate to admit it, but I am grateful. I am grateful to have been able to have an education. A lot of kids in the world can't. 
and an education in the truest sense of the word is a very valuable thing. I mean, I, I got taught my ABCs. That's how I, you know, became, eventually became a decent writer. It taught me the foundations of math, which helped me understand computers later on, multiplication tables and all that. And I don't hate every teacher I've ever had. It might sound like it because it's the ones I hate that I only ever talk about most of the time. But I had a lot of great teachers who I could tell they came into the education system to try and make a positive difference because they actually cared about the kids and they wanted to convey genuine knowledge towards them that could actually help them. And I respect the shit out of that. But speaking from my own experience, I just had one too many bad experiences. You know, if you've got like a if you've got a little cage and you put something in there whether it's a human or an animal, you close that cage door, you pick up a stick, you poke it through the bars and you start poking that person or that animal through the bars for long enough without letting him out and then finally one day you do let him out. You know what? He's always going to be a little bit kind of pissed off at the world, even regardless of his newfound freedom. Even though he can go anywhere now, he's not being poked anymore. It just, it happened a little too frequently for a little too long. And now it's like all he can think about. And he just can't help but look back in anger. It's like the opposite of that Oasis song. Don't look back in anger. No, look back in anger. That's all I can fucking do. I wish I could let go of this fucking hatred, this internal anger that's constantly, this bubbling acidic bile inside me that won't, ever go away but it's there and besides doesn't anybody fucking remember what it was like to be a kid i know when i was a kid i was desperate to like find guys who expressed a similar mentality when it come to when it came to education as i did like i hated i was hated it so much and i was just desperate to like find comedians and people who were like shared my point of view on it you know who were brave enough to say you know what it does suck you know who one of those guys was for me? Bill Watterson. You know what he did? You know what he made? Calvin and Hobbes. An awesome fucking comic strip. Honestly, I think if anything at school should be mandatory reading, it should be that. But of course, schools would never let that happen because it would kind of sully their legitimacy, I bet. Quote unquote legitimacy. Because Bill Watterson would draw strips where Calvin's school would be overrun by raptors and he'd draw in vivid detail teachers and students getting devoured alive fucking awesome when i read that i was like yes somebody gets it thank god i thought everybody around me was a fucking robot oh school's great school's great what's your problem school's great yeah it's so fucking great and i wish you know when i graduated film school i could have been like the other kids you know smiling enjoying the day taking selfies exchanging hugs and shaking hands with my professors but it just wasn't me, man. Sorry, I feel pissed off, and I think I'm warranted to feel pissed off. I'm never going to be okay with the emotional abuse I put up with. You're going to lock me in rooms for six hours a day and intrude on my personal time with all your bullshit fucking homework? You know what, 20 years later, when I'm finally out of this shit, I at least reserve the right to be pissed off and express how I feel about it. Fuck graduation. You know, anything that makes you wear a stupid hat, you know what I mean? I'll just put on this hat. Oh, you're one of us now. That looks really good on you. You're one of us now, okay? You're not one of them anymore. You're one of us. Oh, you know, some goofy fucking outfit. Like I was talking about in the last episode. Those black and pink gowns we had to wear. Black and pink for Christ's sake. And look, I'm not out to offend anybody. I realize some hats have some, you know, religious properties. You know, it, it, symbolize, it symbolizes some kind of proximity to God or access to God or whatever that like it, you know if, if you're religious and you want to wear a hat fine but it's not for me I know I said I'd get off school in this episode but I do want to touch on a few more stories that I'm remembering back in grade school I used to get bullied there was this one kid who'd always taunt me you know if I passed him walking down the hall and he'd make me feel like shit and there was one time where he actually got physically violent it was on like the playground and I can't remember what provoked the fight you know I might have like I might have thrown a ball or something like a basketball on the playground and it might have like you know bounced his way accidentally or like grazed him or knocked him accidentally and he turned around he walks up to me and he grabs me by the scruff of my neck he like he's in he's like at least a couple grades higher than me and much more uh, physically built 
and he grabs me by the scuff of the neck and, you know, pushes me against the wall and lifts me up. And he's like threatening me, like, I'm going to kill you or something like that, or I'm going to hurt you, or it's time to get hurt, something like that. He said something, you know, verbally threatening. But I remember him not following through with it. I guess there was some kind of interruption and he, he dropped me. Maybe, you know, one of the playground security people came by and, and saw the thing and wanted to break it up. It's a little foggy for me. But the point is, you know, this this is a guy that kind of tormented me for a while. And I remember one day, one of my other friends, this is an old friend of mine, he uh, invited me to go frog catching with him. You know, it was a small town we were living in. And he invited me to, like, go catch some frogs by the lake just past this old bridge. And I wasn't really an outdoorsy kind of kid. I, I, I was the type who, who always wanted to stay inside and just play video games you know what i mean like fuck the outdoors but you know for some reason i i decided to go along with this like you know maybe i'll get a kick out of it and so i went and you know i actually found some enjoyment in it like we were just catching and releasing frogs like we'd walk up and down the, the side of the road alongside the lake and listen for them and kind of sneak up on them and catch them in this bucket and just release them later on it was just kind of fun in a kid sort of way you know what i mean and then i found out the guy who had been tormenting me at school was friends with this friend that I was going to the uh, the lakeside with and so he's there with us it's the three of us and he's like being friendly to me all of a sudden it's like the stuff on the playground and at school never even happened he's behaving perfectly normal towards me and then once we went back to school everything reset again it's you know he'd still taunt me in the halls and I was like what the fuck man like right there like I realized God, what this kid's full of shit. I mean, when he's at school, he just wants to impress his buddies. I don't think he even really hates me. It's just the fact that his douchebag friends are surrounding him at school and he wants to, you know, impress them. Like, why can't he just be nice to me? I was always nice to him. I tried to be nice, and you know, in the hopes that, oh, maybe he won't bully me anymore. But I think that just made it worse, you know what I mean? Just made me more of a target because he didn't respect the fact that I wasn't standing up for myself, I suppose. I don't know. Fuck him. And I got another story from grade school. This one actually relates to the origins of uh, R.B. and the Chief, I think, and, you know, the gen my general sense of humor. It was in uh, grade six, I think, and I was in class one day, and a friend of mine was sitting in the desk next to me, and I remember he was really miserable that day. I didn't, I didn't know why, but he just looked really sad compared to how he looked, you know, every other day. And I was like, wow, he's really upset about something. So I wanted to cheer him up. So him, like me, he had a, you know, a foul kind of twisted sense of humor. So I wanted to appeal to that, right? So I did this little thing, like I acted out this little play, I guess you'd call it, with my fingers, like, you know, my middle finger and index finger are the two legs. And I was just like having two guys on my desk kicking each other in the nuts. Like, so I would just lift my index finger between the two fingers of my other hand. And so I was miming these two guys kicking, kicking each other in the balls. And I was saying over and over, like, I'm going to kick you in the nuts or something like that. Like, I'm going to kick you in the nuts. And the kid starts, my friend starts laughing. And I'm like, oh, great. I'm making him feel better. And then I realize he's not laughing at me, but he's laughing at something behind me. He, like, he, I can see his, his gaze kind of shifting a little bit. So I look over my shoulder and I see my sixth grade teacher staring me right in the face like he's an his face is an inch away from my face and he's staring me with this frown like and his like eyes are super wide like dinner plates and i'm just like so like i've jerked backwards whole, like holy shit i didn't see that coming and i'm like who the fuck does that what a weirdo this was the same teacher by the way who i talked about in a previous podcast my uh, the first episode i think this was the guy that pulled my binder out of my cubby hole walked to the front of the class and started pulling out all the loose sheets of paper one by one and dropping them onto the floor. And, you know, I got on my hands and knees groveling to pick them up, which pissed me off. I wish I hadn't done that. But anyway, this was this, this was the same guy, right? And I got in trouble for doing that. He's like, I, I, I had to go to his office after school and he called my mom to come by the school and sit in on this little lecture that he was going to give me in his office. And so after school, I go to his office and he's sitting behind his desk like the big, you know, the big chief. So fucking important. 
and I'm sitting there in the student hot seat, you know, oh, I'm in the doghouse because I did this thing. I was just trying to make my fucking friend feel better. My mom's there. And then the teacher starts talking down to me like he's trying to impress my mom. You know what I mean? He's, he's just like, you know, maybe maybe you shouldn't be say in class. You shouldn't be saying things like I'm going to kick you. I'm going to bust bust your balls. You shouldn't say it. that's that's rude language. OK, busting your balls in class. You shouldn't say that. And I'm, the whole time I'm thinking, I'm not talking back to him, but the whole time I'm fucking thinking, what, what, this is such a load of horse shit. I, like, this is, this should be all about intention, right? And I was just trying to make my fucking friend feel better. I wasn't trying to, like, make, cause a ruckus in the class. Class wasn't even, you know, progressing. Like, we were all waiting for the teacher to arrive. You know, the whole the class, there's no teacher in it. Like, the students were just kind of chattering. And, you know, waiting for somebody to come in and start the lesson. So, I mean, it wasn't wasn't like there was anything to interrupt. Friends were talking to each other all, all around me. So I was just, you know, trying to make this guy, this friend of mine, laugh because I thought he was upset. And I was just trying to appeal to his sense of humor because it was similar to mine. So essentially, I got in trouble for trying to appeal to somebody else's rude sense of humor and trying to make him laugh. And then I walked outside the school with my mom and my mom's looking at me and she's going like, why, why would you say things like that in school? And I don't think I explained, like, oh, God, there's so many, cir like, circumstances I look back on, and I wish, like, like, I knew, I, like, I know how to ex have explained myself in those situations now. But back then, you know, I think I knew in the back of my mind, but I didn't know how to articulate it. I could, I'm, I was always very bad at defending myself in arguments, because I, I just don't like conflict. I don't like getting in arguments with people. And so I don't know why I didn't stick up for myself, but, you know, I was just like, oh, I don't know why I said it. You know, I was just, I don't even know if I explained to her that I was trying to make my friend laugh. And it's so fucking rich, you know, because here I am, like, what, 15 years later, and I'm getting paid to do the same shit, to be inappropriate, to say rude words. Like, what's the big fucking deal, man, if a kid swears in school? Adults swear all the time. Sorry, where, where do you think we might have picked it up from, you fucking idiots? And you know what? School is a stressful place. Sorry if we want to vent some aggression now and then. You ever wonder why kids pick up smoking while they're in school? I'll give you a hint. It's not to look cool most of the time. It's for fucking stress relief. Because a lot of kids at school are fucking miserable. Like me. Uh. And I got another story here. This one isn't from grade school. This, this one is from post-secondary. And um, this was uh, the same teacher that... You know, I wrote a script for starring a like a coke addict teacher who teaches at the school for a week and gets caught snorting coke off a toilet seat. It was the same teacher, right? The, the teacher who called me into his office to talk about my problem with authority. And we're in this kind of like workshop like class in the computer lab. And within that class, we're supposed to partner up with somebody, research a certain subject, you know, within the realm of filmmaking provide some kind of uh there was some graphic design involved like we would we, one of us would come up with an image and then the other person in the group would write like a paragraph summarizing you know the point that we were trying to make through this imagery and i remember me and my partner picked this uh to do to do a project on a, the idea of the mobius strip and we did this kind of thing where we we com we mixed the mobian strip design with like yin and yang into this interesting combination in the in the image that we were doing. If for those that don't know, a Mobius strip is uh, like if you cut a strip of paper, like like a thin rectangle, and you 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 fold one, you turn one twist in it, and you tape the ends together, and then you're able to like put your finger on one side, and run your entire finger along the surface. And the point, it, the point of it is that you can run your finger along the surface infinitely with no obstruction. So it's kind of like a symbol for infinity, right? And we were mixing that with yin and yang. And I wrote a paragraph in carefully considered and carefully worded prose. And, you know, my friend dis, uh, designed this image. And we both went up to the front of the class and we relayed our point. And I thought it was, I thought I did, I thought we both did a pretty good job. And so I sit down and then the teacher of that class, I remember he had an assistant who would sort of act as a, a teacher underneath his instruction, his supervision or whatever. And the teacher's assistant came up to me and he leans down next to me at my, I'm sitting at my computer, right? And he leans down next to me and he's like, uh, 
just want to let you know, uh, you and your partner, uh, we we have given you a B on your assignment. And I'm like, look, I, I don't care about grades, right? But in this one instance, I partnered up with this guy and I decided I'm going to do a good job on this assignment with this guy. Like, we're going to make a good job of this. And, you know, if I get an A on an assignment here and there, it'll let me slack off on other assignments so it'll balance out into a passable grade at the end of the day. You know what I mean? So I'm thinking in my head, like, why a B? Why not an A? What wasn't we did wrong? I mean, I'm not, I'm not demanding they give me an A, but I would like to know why not an A. You know what I mean? Like, tell me where I could improve. What was it that I did wrong? Because I'm convinced that we did a solid job. So what's with this B grade? And so I asked him, I'm like, can you tell me what I did wrong? Like, why only a B? Because, you know, I honestly think we deserve an A. This was the one time I made a fuss about this. I never mentioned this. I never did this at any other point. But in this one instance, I was like, you know what? I think I deserve an A for this. And so I told the assistant this and the assistant's like, okay, uh, I'm going to talk with the instructor. I'll be right back. So for 15 minutes, he leaves and he talks to the teacher and he comes back and he says, uh, you know what, after you talked to me, you, you told me your thoughts. We've decided to upgrade your grade to a B plus. I'm like, okay, s still not an A, a B plus now. So obviously I was still doing something wrong, right? Because why wouldn't I get an A otherwise? So I'm like, okay, fair enough if that's what you think. But can you tell me what I did wrong then? How can I improve? How can I get better? What did I do wrong? Tell me. And he says, uh, oh, we, we, we can't tell you. I'm afraid I can't go into detail. I'm sorry. <clears throat> I'm sitting there like, are you serious? Like I'm half laughing and he's looking at me and he's laughing. And, you know, I'm kind of smiling. I don't know if he knows, but I'm kind of smiling through my teeth. I'm like, you are so full of shit and you know it. You know it. You know you're full of shit right now. I'm like, you, you, you can't tell me what I did wrong? Sorry, why the fuck am I in school again? Why am I paying to be here again? Aren't you here to teach me what I'm doing wrong so I can fix it? Or what is your feedback, fu your discussion that you had, whatever it is, so fucking secret? Is it in the vault now? Not to be accessed by anybody. Need two guys, with each with a key, simultaneously to open up the lock that this fucking feedback is in. Like you're launching a nuclear fucking missile. What, am I not going to be able to understand it, you fucking assholes? Is my tiny student brain too small to comprehend your grand fucking ideas of what my assignment should have been? Was there even a discussion? Or are you just pulling these grades out of a fucking hat? Or your ass? If it's a hat, what kind of hat is it? Is it like a magician's hat? Is it like a snapback baseball cap? Can I try it on? It might look good on me. Sometimes I can pull off a hat. Fucking bullshit, man. I mean, wouldn't that piss you off, the listener, if you were confronted with that? Am I crazy? Am I wrong here? Am I insane for not liking school? I guess I must be right, because education is so fucking precious. The ends justify the means, right? As long as we get an education, all, all that the fucking emotional abuse and all this unfair treatment and bullshit grades. Forgive and forget. No, fuck you. If nobody makes a fuss about it like I am right now, you know, it's never going to get fixed. Maybe because of this, one future teacher might go... You know what? That is bullshit. I'm not going to be that way when I'm a teacher. I'm going to talk to students straight and treat them with dignity and respect. And I'm going to care about their success. Make sure they're getting, they're going to get to where they're heading. Try to help them, you know, achieve their dreams as much as I can. I remember reading a comment on uh, my one of my previous podcasts where I talked about post-secondary. And I talked about that teacher who I gave the script to who invited me into his office to talk about it. But what, how oh, I'm such a troublemaker. And people were saying I was being unfair because, you know, why wouldn't the teacher assume that I was, you know, making an attack on him? Like trying to personify the teacher through this character that was, you know, the coke addict who teaches for a week. Who teaches all the wrong information. I mean, the way I wrote it, I intentionally made it so fucking ridiculous that it's obviously a joke. And I was going to play the character. So in a way, I, like I'm making myself look foolish, you know what I mean? And believe me, this guy proved himself to be much more conceited than I originally thought later on. Like that fucking B, B plus horse shit. And I remember in class, like in one of his lectures, he used to wedge in the fact that he had this, what he called an alumni cabin. 
like a cabin somewhere, you know, ex in the secluded wilderness where his graduate students would go, you know, to sit and meditate and think on the stuff that he taught them. Like, I'm sitting there going, are you fucking serious? The balls on this guy, his fucking alumni cabin where his graduates go to meditate on what they learned. Fuck off. And, you know, he'd, he'd, he'd bring that up in such a way that, you know, it seemed like kind of an off-the-cuff comment. You know what I mean? Like, oh, by the way, this thing. But, it, you know, it was so deliberate. Because, like, the, he taught this class and he would teach, like, our student, our graduating year was divided into two bodies, right? And he would teach the same class for each body. And he would say the same fucking thing and each time in both classes and each time he would pretend that that mentioning of his fucking alumni cabin was was just like a, you know, by the way, oh, almost forgot to mention this thing like it just occurred to him ever since that I've been making jokes about how like I've been like people are like, oh, I haven't seen you in a while, John. Where have you been? Oh, I was just at the alumni cabin fucking <laughs> reflecting on all this valuable knowledge that I was taught. Stuff that I could research on Wikipedia in five fucking seconds. And I joke about how I, I was spending months, like even years up there in this fucking cabin, you know, big beard, chopping wood. I mean, I imagine when that teacher was hired at that institution, like he was probably initially at a cabin, like some secluded fucking hero in an action movie. And, you know, the post-secondary staff would land, would land nearby in a fucking helicopter and come out. We need you to teach. I left that behind me a long time ago. We need you back in the game. I guess those students really need me. All right, I'll do it. Day 100 at the alumni cabin. Food rations running low. But thankfully, all these grand ideas that the teacher taught me is giving me sustenance. I haven't eaten in three months. <sighs> Look, I know I'm a bitter fuck, all right? I said it before, I'll say it again. I know. It's a comedy podcast, and I'm just getting out my frustration because I think it's funny, all right? And it's it's therapeutic for me. I know it's senseless. Like, nobody should fucking listen to me. I'm not trying to make a point here. I know I'm fucking crazy. Don't listen. Nobody listen to me, all right? These are just the ramblings of a madman. That's it. Just take everything with a grain of salt. I obviously haven't thought everything through that I'm saying here, but you know, I talk about things that immediately piss me off. Sometimes I don't know why it pisses me off, but they just do, you know? And I'm not here to target anybody or ruin anybody's reputation. I don't want to mention any names. That's not what this is about. It's just about me getting my feelings out, the way I feel about things. Because, you know, I'm angry and I think I've got some things to say. I think I've got some, some things to say that are valuable. Fuck school, man. And stop trying to convince kids that it's awesome. It's never awesome. School is always going to suck. It always has sucked. It does suck. And it's always going to suck. Because it's just somewhere that you have to be regardless of what you want. You know what I mean? Like, you got to get up early to go to this thing because we said so. We said so. We're grown-ups. We said so. We know what we're talking about. Be here at 8.30 a.m. or you're going to be in so much trouble, young man. You want your parents to go to jail? You better come to school then. Are adults honestly surprised that kids hate school? That they're... Well, I'm not saying not all kids hate school, but a lot of kids must hate school. It just sucks, right? Are there adults out there that are really shocked by that? Do, haven't, weren't they it's in school themselves? Do they forget how much it sucked? Don't they have that rebellious spirit in them still? Or do you turn 40 and you just become a fucking robot? Don't you still have that inner kid in you that wants to tell everybody to fuck off and flip, give them the finger? Because that's how I feel. And I think, you know, that makes people interesting, as irrational as it might be. I like people like that, who, st who are like kids on the inside, you know what I mean? Who know how to have fun and have a good sense of humor and know how to laugh and make me laugh and make other people laugh. Those are the kind of people I want to be around fucking grades so stupid like that that guy that teacher's assistant coming up to me and saying you know talking about oh you got a b and then you know after your criticism you got a b plus telling me like i was upgraded to a from a b to a b plus is like telling me it's like going up to me and saying oh uh in, in, instead of a star sticker you get a smiley face sticker for doing a good job like, put whatever sticker you want down i don't give a fuck I know where you can stick your stickers up your ass. But no, no, I'm a psycho, right? These are just the ramblings of a bitter psycho who doesn't know what he's talking about. Because old people have so much more wisdom than us, right? All the time. In fact, all kids who hate school must be insane, right? Let's just drug them. Let's just drug them until they don't even know where they are anymore. 
until they're so fucking pacified. Oh, I love school. School is great. I love doing math. I love doing homework. It's such an enriching process. Open up, Timmy. It's time for more Ritalin. You know how you get with without your Ritalin. Normal. But, but, Mom, I feel dizzy. I think I've had enough Ritalin to... <laughs> Stick a fucking funnel in his mouth. Just pour the Ritalin into the funnel, right? It'll help you relax. It'll help you relax. Wow, you're right. School is so great. <sighs> All right, guys. I think that's enough for now. Um, it, it's that it's that time it's that time of the podcast again, guys. It's time for some fan mail. All right, let's answer some fan mail. All right, here we go. Hi, John. Big fan. I was wondering what your ideal Sonic game would be. Thanks, and keep up the amazing work. You know, I don't know how many of my listeners are like retro Sonic fans, but have you guys seen Sonic Mania? Holy shit, that looks cool. Seriously, that's like the first really cool thing to come along in a while. I mean, when Sonic 4 Episode 1 was announced, I looked at that and I was like, it's a, it's a step in the right direction, but I mean, it's not quite there. I mean, you know, the, the music, like the melodies were kind of all right, but all the instruments were exactly the same. Like it was the same drum, the same snare, the same hat, and you know, the same melody instrument, whatever, like strings, whatever it was. And I don't, I don't like the model for mo- modern Sonic. You know, his his limbs are a little too long and weirdly proportioned, and his his spikes look a little too like soft and big in comparison to his face. And it, he doesn't really come off like he has an attitude like he should. You know, like he used to. He just comes off as kind of campy and cringy with the, like all these stupid one-liners, and you know, all the characters are a little too like soft and round-edged and happy and, you know, cheery. Old Sonic had a fucking attitude, man. Like, you'd boot up Sonic CD, you'd start the game. If you if you didn't pause the game and you left Sonic idle, he would, like, look at... He would, like, shoot you a look and wave his finger at you and tap his foot impatiently with his, his brows furrowed like he's really pissed off. And if you let a couple minutes go by where uh, Sonic is idle on the screen, he would be like, I'm out of here. And he would jump off the level and you would get a game over. Like, regard, I think regardless of how many lives you had, it would be just be an instant game over. I'm like, that's, that's cool, man. Like, that's, like, that's his character coming through the gameplay. Like, they found a way to do that. That's interesting. But, of course, you'd never find a game like that nowadays, because every fucking game has to hold your hand and give you an achievement unlock for, like, going to the fucking start menu. Or, you know, keeping your fucking saliva in your mouth. Achievement unlocked! You access the options menu. Achievement unlocked. You started a new game. Achievement unlocked. There's no real sense of discovery, you know, or discovering secrets in games because, you know, there's just like strategy guides everywhere and there's, you know, a fucking achievement unlocked for everything. So, you know, if you want to get a hint as to what all the video game secrets are, you just look at the achievements list or the trophies list or whatever the fuck it is. And it just tells you, like, all the little secrets. Like, it gives you all the little hints. Like, you gotta do this to unlock this. You know, there can be no stone left unturned. You know what I mean? And it's fun to have, like, a stone left unturned. Like, I love, I love like, Easter eggs and cool secret shit in video games that are super hard to find and create, like, this kind of creepy past the mystique about it, you know, that people are talking about over the internet. Like, Super Mario Sunshine, at the bottom of that, like, level in a bottle, there's that secret book, like if you positioned Mario in a very specific place and you rotated the camera with the C-stick, you could peer into like an unused room and there would be like a book on the ground. And everyone's like, what's that thing? Can Is there a way to access it? Like, you know, Ocarina of Time, you know, all those rumors that, you know, you could find the Triforces in the game. Did you know that? Did you know there's a Sky Temple? Just weird shit like that. Like, you don't really f- see that kind of shit in video games anymore. Halo 2, thank God, that actually tried to do something cool with the Scarab gun. And then, like, Halo 3, where you had to jump into all the rings in one of the fun- one of the last levels in sequence. And it would play, like, a chime. And it would unlock, like, a skull or something. I can't remember. But that shit's cool, man. But so many games gotta hold your hand now. And, like, a strategy guide has to list, like, every fucking secret. So there's no real sense of, like, discovering something that's, you know, uncharted or unexplored. Like, being the first to like come across something as a regular player and be like, oh my god, what's this thing? I gotta tell the world. 
I don't know, whatever. But anyway, Sonic, Sonic Mania. If you haven't checked that out, if you're a Sonic retro fan, check out uh, the announcement trailer for that. It's not out yet. I mean, it's I think it's still a ways away. It probably won't come out until 2017, I think. But man, it it like it it really nails, I think, the the Genesis and Sonic CD. Look, that, like there's so many details that they just got right. Like, Sonic's model looks cool. It has some, like, 3D effects, like like it's taken out of Sonic 3D Blast, almost. That was for Genesis. And they added the new drop dash move, which is cool. And they kept, like, the Sonic CD sound effects. Like, when he jumps, it just goes, whoop, whoop. And just the, the look of it, it feels like Genesis Sonic. It feels like old school Sonic. And even though the level design... I mean, they only had a couple of demo levels to show. It was like some Green Hill Zone kind of spinoff, and then this, like, Studiopolis Zone, which is like a... It's like a kind of Hollywood, Neo-Tokyo, almost chemical plant zone kind of level. And it had all these really fine details in, in the art of the level design and, like, the backgrounds, those paraplexing backgrounds that are, like, multi-layered and give, you know, the view of the city a sense of depth. It's like, wow, this is a labor of love, man. They, they put so much thought into this, to like getting all the fine details exactly right. And it actually fucking looks and feels like Sonic. That's awesome. It's the most excited about Sonic I've ever been. I mean, whatever that new thing is from Sonic Team that's coming out, you know that CG trailer where it's like, I don't know, big, big text against black, and then you see Eggman and his Egg Robo conquering a city. And it, I guess it's another, like, Generations thing, because you see, like, Modern Sonic and Retro Sonic kind of partnering up against evil. And, you know, people are asking me, like, are you excited about that? I'm like, I don't know, I guess. Well, not really. I mean, it's kind of cool. The cinematic was kind of cool, but that shouldn't be a trailer. If you're making a trailer for a video game, you know what it should have? Fucking gameplay. I want to see how it plays. The Sonic Mania trailer, that's how you make a fucking trailer. Show us the fucking game. They used to be so fucking stupid with, like, Call of Duty commercials. And they would, like, film a live-action commercial for it. Fuck off, who cares? I don't care how flashy you make this game seem through this live-action bullshit. Cover me! I'm going in! Roger! Explosions. Like, just show, show me the game. Sell me on the game. Because you know what I see when I see a live-action trailer? I immediately get the sense that you're trying to like compensate for the fact that you don't want to show us gameplay because you're worried that it sucks i feel like you're hiding something show me the gameplay that's how you make a video game trailer all right sonic generations was kind of cool i mean it was it felt like half a decent game like i loved all the generations part where no well not the, i mean like the retro sonic parts where you play as sonic and it's like a 2d perspective it's 3d graphics but like from a 2d classic perspective i love playing those stages but then you would have to play like the modern sonic sta stages on top of that in order to progress through the game and it wasn't that bad i mean it was probably one of the best iterations of modern sonic gameplay wise that they've ever done but it still just kind of sucks in comparison you know it's just it's kind of like this tumor that's on like a decent game like, just chop that off and just, just just give me the retro Sonic part of Sonic Generations. That's all I want. Here's an email from Nick about act structure. Hey, John, I have a question about act structure. On your old blog, you described the three-act structure, which helped me out. But season eight of Arby and the Chief is five acts. I asked this question before, and you revealed the general premise of what happens in each act. But... What I was looking for was how to write a five-act story and how it's different than writing a three-act story. This question is in response to an article by James Bonnet on the Writer's Store. He basically said that act structure is arbitrary, as it's just imaginary lines dividing a story and that it won't have an effect on the plot, or that it means nothing in film as it's not a performance. Do you agree or have anything to add? Okay, uh, first of all, sorry for not answering you properly the first time, if I'm reading that right. Um, the reason, like, the whole season is five acts, but each episode individually is still, is still following the three-act structure. It's just three acts for each. And I guess what you were saying, you know, from that article that you were reading, I guess there is a small kernel of truth. Like, the, the division of season eight into five acts isn't that significant. I mean... 
I am trying to make each of those acts distinct in its own way. But you could just as easily say that, you know, Act 1 is Act 1, and then Act 2 and Act 3 and Act 4 are all Act 2, and then Act 5 is Act 3. Like, no matter how many act breaks you have, it can all still fall into the basic paradigm of three acts. You know, you know, overlacing all of that. You know what I mean? I remember one time over Twitter, like, I had posted on my website, like, some writing advice that, that was, like, adhere to the three-act structure because it just works and all something like that. And this guy messaged me over Twitter saying, hey, you know, before you start preaching your screenwriting bullshit, you know, claiming that you know everything, you should definitely read this. And then he, like, po he uh, shares this, um, like, PDF thing with me. It's like an excerpt from this book on screenwriting. And it's, it's like kind of a, it's a comedic instructional screenwriting book. And it, you know, supposedly like on the cover, it says written by the Hulk and the, the comedic shtick of it is that the whole book is written in all caps, you know, because it's, it's the Hulk that's writing it and he's angry and all caps means angry. So the whole book has to be a little angry and you're not or angry, you know, just all, all caps all the way through. And I'm reading this and I'm like, this is a little like, I get the joke of it. I appreciate a good joke. But the whole book is in written in all caps t to service this one stupid joke. Like, that's a little obnoxious. You know, having being forced to read a book that's written in all capital letters. Sorry. You know, we have lowercase and uppercase letters for a reason. Especially for writing fucking books. You write a book that's over a fucking hundred pages long. You might want to consider not doing it in all caps, even if you think it's such a funny fucking joke. But anyway, the premise of this book was that the three-act structure is kind of bullshit, and really, a story should have as many act breaks as you can like possibly fit in there, because act breaks are interesting. Because what, what an act break represents, and I do agree with this, is that it the act break represents a point of no return for the character. It's like a line that a, that a character crosses the main character, in all likelihood, it is a it is a point where that character crosses a line that there is no coming back from. It's like they, they make a decision that has permanent consequences that it's impossible to reverse at that point. It's it's like the care. It's if you were to visualize it very simply, it would be like your main character opening up a door and closing it behind them and the door locks. It's like, OK, there's no turning back. There's only forward now. OK, what happens? That's what an act break is. We're in a new act now. And this book was making the argument that there should, there should, you shouldn't just limit yourself to three acts. You should have, you could have like a twenty or a thirty or a fifty act sort story. And I'm like, okay, fine, but there's still, there's no reason why, like, you can have fine, have all the act breaks you want, but there's no reason that that all those act breaks can't fall under a very broad three act paradigm. You fucking idiot. Okay, shithead. Because you know what? There is satisfaction in threes. There's a rule of threes that applies to a lot of different things, like joke telling, for instance. You know, you see one image and you see a second image, they're both normal, and then you see a third image that's really absurd and it stands out, and then you get a laugh out of it, right? A lot of jokes like that in all kinds of comedy shows. And it, there's especially satisfaction in threes in terms of storytelling because people for so long have been accustomed to the idea of beginning, middle, end. Act 1, Act 2, Act 3. You know what I mean? That's what all, everybody tells you. All stories have a beginning, a middle, and an end. And I will, I will always stand by the, the, the idea that the three-act structure is a good thing. I think it is just good storytelling to have the first 25% of your movie be set up and then have 50% of it, the chunk in the middle, be like action and conflict, and then the last 25% being the resolution of the story. When an audience watches that, when they're leaving the theater, they go, you know what, that movie was really well proportioned, it was really well paced. People appreciate that, that's just good storytelling, I think. And I think to stray from that is risky. So, back to the email, in regard to this James Bonnet guy, saying that the act structure is arbitrary, as it is just imaginary lines dividing a story, and that it won't have an effect on the plot, it has, a f it has an effect on the pacing and the structure. And I'm a huge structure guy. That's what I look for and appreciate in movies. Any movie that you really like, I guarantee, like, go go back and watch it. 
Skip to the 30 minute mark, see what happens. It's usually the first plot point that brings you into Act 2. Then go three quarters of the way through the movie and you'll see that's the point where all hope is lost and the main character is super sad and something's something's got to give, something's got to change within him to bring the bring the story to a resolution. And then the end of the movie and you, you compare the, the final frame to the opening image of the movie and see how the main character has changed. That's a well-structured movie. People appreciate that. So to say that the act structure is arbitrary, I'm not sure I really agree with. I don't think it's arbitrary. I think it's, it's I think it's a huge factor in good storytelling is structure. And back to the email again, that it means nothing in film as it's not a performance. Film is not a performance or act are you talking about act structure? Obviously. I mean, if you're trying to say there's no performance in film, you're a fucking retard. Obviously there is. I'm not talking to you, the guy who sent this email. I'm talking about this guy who wrote the article. But anyway, I've said my piece on the three-act structure. I think it's a good thing. And I think that within that broad three-act structure, sure, you can have as many sub-act breaks as you want. Okay, I got another email here. This one is from uh, Seth, and this is an interesting one. Hi, John. You're doing a great job on Season 8 of Arby and the Chief. I think so far it is my favorite season. Anyways, after listening to the last podcast episode, Film School 3, you going on about how a word's definition is not is only what we attach to it and how parents need to know about what is actually going on online reminded me of a story. So before I tell the actual story, I have to give a little context. This was around the release of Call of Duty Modern Warfare and I was about six to seven years old. Little kid me was playing the fuck out of that, along with Halo 3 of course, assuming my stepbrother wasn't dominating the Xbox. Back in elementary school, there was an event going on called Buddy Reading Day, where you are supposed to make a book and read it to the younger grades, or something along the lines of that. It's been a while and haven't thought about it since. At any rate, when I got partnered up with my buddy, instead of doing the assignment, he dragged me along to go talk with his friends, which made me a bit uncomfortable since I already was getting nervous about meeting someone new that was a whole four grades above me. So we approach his friends, and the one kid that was of Middle Eastern descent immediately insults me for wearing some capri or some jean shorts. So being the little shit that I am, replied by saying he should screw himself, calling him a terrorist, and that I killed his friends in Call of Duty 4. Oh, Jesus. Oh, boy, this guy. They all laughed, and that was the end of it until about five to six years later when I was the big sixth grader. I rotated back into my homeroom, which was across the hall from my language slash social studies room, and since it was the end of the day, I, ju I was just dicking around with my friends, waiting to be able to get home and play Reach. They sat us in a semicircle of chairs while we were all joking about what books we were going to make. The teachers got up front and started talking about how there was a final project coming up and we had to make our own books and read them to the younger grades. A little while after they explained the premise of the project, they talk about how one of the kids a couple years ago called his reading buddy a terrorist. Oh boy. And that apparently after class when they were done reading, he went up to the teachers and started crying. Ah, oh, jeez. They also explained that they don't have an idea who did it <laughs> and expected he switched schools. Oh, boy. As, a, as soon as I heard the word terrorist, I went from joking with my friends to a blank stare. Thank God the kid didn't know my name or my dad would have never let me touch a computer again. They wrapped it up by talking about how we leave an impression on kids and to be careful around them, even though it was vice versa. So when you started reminiscing about the old days and when trash talk was funny, it made me think of that story. While I don't fully agree with you in, on the meaning of words, since lots of people are unwilling to adapt, I do agree that there needs to be some sort of way to let parents know what gaming and online culture are like. Keep up the good work and keep the stories coming in, Seth. P.S. I hope you like the stench of my taint on your mom's breath. She was great last night. Thanks for your... <laughs> Thanks for your email, Seth. I appreciate you sharing that story, by the way. Um, that probably couldn't have been an easy thing to do. And, uh, 
you know what? You might be right. Maybe I am wrong about the definition of words thing. Maybe I'm simplifying it too much. You know, in a previous podcast, I was saying before that I don't think I was saying that words, they just boil down to vowels and consonant sounds coming out of our mouths that we we they only mean the meaning that we give it as a society as a society. And I was comparing it to money, how it's like paper money and how like in and of itself it isn't worth anything but the it, it's only worth the value that 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 we give it as a society we give it power we give money power we give words power and you know i think on a certain level what i'm saying is kind of irrefutable cuz i mean it is it is vowels and consonant sounds i mean if you say it over and over it kind of loses its meaning after a while it just kind of sounds like white noise i mean it is literally like th- it only means the meaning that we give it. I mean, I'm not wrong when I say that, right? But I see what you're getting at. Like, like I think I think you're saying that I'm saying that, like, the whole words will never hurt me thing is bullshit. And, you know, I agree with you that, like, I didn't mean to come across that way. I think word words do hurt people. Words have hurted me. Words have hurt me. But I think it really comes down to intent. Like, when when you called that kid a terrorist back when you were six and seven years old, look, I get it. I mean, you probably didn't mean it, but you know it, the way you said it. Were you were you joking? Like, did you did you kind of laugh it off afterwards and say I'm just joking? I mean, it doesn't sound like it. The way this kid kind of, you the way you this the way this kid reacted that you later found out about. Presumably, you said that you called him a terrorist and you were killing his friends in Call of Duty Modern Warfare. I'm laughing. I mean, it's not funny, but it kind of is. Like you were saying this stuff to him. Like, what what was your intent? When you said that, did you just really want to hurt him? Or were you thinking like, you know, I'm, I'm saying this deadpan, I'm, I'm playing it straight, but I hope he knows I'm joking. He probably knows I'm joking. It's like, like, is that what we, was going through your head? Because for me, it always comes down to intent. Like comedians say horrible fucking things all the time, but the, the point is that they don't mean those things. They're just trying to get a rise out of people and get a laugh out of people first and foremost. That's the point. I mean, for for jokes, there is no justification for jokes, other than they're just jokes. You're not comedians. Often aren't trying to make a point, really. They're just trying to get a laugh. They're trying to get as much laughter out of people as possible. And sometimes the way to make people laugh is to bring them, you know, bring an audience into places they feel uncomfortable and make them, you know, show them the the funny side of it. And you know, things that seemed taboo before, all of a sudden aren't so taboo anymore and they're kind of open to discussion in a way that they weren't before comedy's come such a long way i mean can you believe there was a time where like you know the likes of joan rivers you know were were getting up on stage and the mere mention of the word pregnancy would get like shocks you know shocked gasps out of the audience like oh did, did she really say that pregnancy oh my god and now look at comedy. Look at stand-up comedy now. Look at comedy in general now. I mean, it's so much more explicit and visceral. And it's a good thing, right? Because it, like, it's about sharing the human experience, who we really are as people, and, you know, relating to one another on, like, a fundamental level and coming coming to terms with truths about being human that aren't necessarily comforting, you know, that aren't necessarily great things. I mean, it's... But they they are true aspects of humanity nonetheless, regardless of how dark they might be. And, you know, they need to be acknowledged. They need to be brought to light so that that we can understand them and possibly grow and improve. So, I mean, whether whether I think you should have said that to that kid or not, I mean, I I would hope that you you said it in a joking manner and you hope that he had a mutual understanding of that. But, you know, I'm guessing you didn't. And, you know, I get it. Kids are cruel. They say, I've done some... I've done some asshole shit as a kid that I wish I didn't, but you know, I learned, I grew, I realized that was wrong. I mean, it was, it was nothing that bad. I I never really, I never would, would say something like that to another kid in earnest. I don't mean, I don't mean to make you feel bad, but that was always a thing for me. Like if I were to make an offensive joke, I would, I would always try my best to make sure the other guy knew that I was joking. But anyway, thanks for your email, man. I appreciate it. And thank you again for sharing your story. All right, guys, that is the end of this episode. It's fucking three in the morning. I'm recording this in my car again. I'm starting to get tired. 
I think it's about time I wrap this up. So thank you, everybody, for listening. You're listening to the See Me After Class podcast. It's available on SoundCloud, John CJG 42069 with dashes in between. John-420-69 on SoundCloud. That's my username. That's where you can find episodes of the podcast and you can find uh, music tracks that I make and upload. Check out my website, imaginativelogo.com. I'm also working on an eighth season of Arby the Chief, in case you don't know. If you'd like to help me out on Patreon, go to uh, patreon.com slash jcjgram. That's my username. Pledge two bucks or more and you can get access to bonus episodes of this podcast. So, you know, it becomes a weekly podcast as opposed to a bi-monthly podcast. So if you want the show more frequently, consider helping me out on Patreon. It really does help. And I will see you next time. I hope you enjoyed the show. Thank you for listening. I'll see you next time.